Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the System.io podcast with me, Natasha Pinto. Today, our guest is John Whitford. He's a digital marketing consultant, YouTuber, and sales funnel specialist. Welcome, John. Hey, Natasha. It's so good to be chatting with you and the entire community. Oh, it is lovely to have you on here. We're really excited to kind of pick your brain on all things sales funnels and online business. But before we get into that, my first question that I like to ask our guests is, can you give us a little bit of your history? So take me through where you thought you were headed with your studies, with your career, and what put you on the path to where you are today? Oh, it's been a fantastic journey. I'm so grateful to be here today uh, because our story really could have gone a very different direction. Uh, my wife and I, we met and fell in love in college and we were both industrial engineers. And if you don't know what that means, it's basically the idea of thinking of the world as a big process map of a big flow chart and trying to figure out how generally businesses can operate more efficiently. All right, so we, we did not go down the entrepreneurial path even though we had some inspiration from our, our parents had started business and, and things like that. But we went down the, the classic corporate American route, getting a standard nine to five job, doing that whole thing and working in engineering. And it was a great, it was not a bad career. And I'm for the record, like I love entrepreneurship, but there's no problem with having a job. But I know we're going to talk about some of the cool things that have happened with the freedom that we now have. So after a few years of our corporate career, uh, we you know, had the whole kid thing. We started the family and we realized that um, giving so much time to our careers was really stealing away from other aspects of our life. So my wife, uh, we were able to, we're in a position where she could stay home with our babies and I would continue to hold down the fort in the job. Uh, fast forward about five, six months, and she needed something to do with her professional energy as well. She, just changing the diapers and being the mom is a fantastic vocation, but she still had so much energy she wanted to dive in professionally. So she started blogging and I would help her at night. I was, I've was i always been the techie one of the family. So she would write the content. I would help her uh, with some of the different aspects. I would love to learn WordPress and all these great things. And over time, that consistent energy of in between nap times and when I came home from work, we were able to build the blog into something of an income stream. And again, fast forward a little bit more, and I started to realize that this could be a, a path to freedom. And I learned skills to scale the blog, and I learned about sales funnels. I learned about Facebook advertising. I learned about selling online courses. And fast forward, we went from making like, zero dollars and zero cents for months on the blog to then starting to make a little bit of affiliate commission to then starting to have an, our own digital products to then having an agency a freelancing uh, some membership off offers and then reaching over you know hundred to uh, two hundred thousand dollars per month from our online business and it got to the point where it was like there's no reason for me to give eight to ten to twelve hours of my life to another job I left, I put my two weeks notice in and it's been real fun, smooth sailing. Uh, I'm sorry, not smooth sailing. It's been a great journey. There's been ups and downs with entrepreneurship. I'm not going to, uh, I'll be completely honest with you and the audience. Obviously there's more challenges when you have to make all the decisions yourself, but we left our job or I left my job probably about, is it four, five years ago now? I don't know. It's, it's, it's a few years at this point. Um, and it's been a fantastic journey and we're, we're just enjoying the freedom we have serving our audience and being there with our kids when they're out of school. <laughs> That's a fantastic story. And I think it'll resonate with a lot of the people in our audience because often when you start your online business, it's not because you decided that's what you were going to do with your life. That's what you're going to study. Lots of people sort of happen upon it or accidentally fall into doing something for themselves, especially because they want those benefits. They want that financial freedom. They want that physical freedom. And also that freedom of time. You know, someone else is not in charge of how many hours you spend working, which is great, especially if you've got a family. Absolutely. It's been one of those where there's always been that little voice inside my head. And I think a lot of the audience has probably had that voice before where they would see somebody do something. And for me, I remember I would listen to podcasts like this one on the way to work every morning. I had a 45 minute there and 45 minute commute back to and from the office every day. And so that would be my time to either pray, call family or listen to podcasts. And I just, I can't remember that episode, but I think, you know, like many others, I listened to Pat Flynn years ago and I thought, how is this guy doing that? And that was really one of the inspirations to get started. And so for anybody who's listening, um, the, the path we're going to talk about in this interview, it's not a straight 
or a straight road, there's going to be curves you take, but simply know that if you have that little voice inside yourself of just, Hey, what could be, what is possible? I just urge you in whichever way you can pursue it, whether it's an hour a day, whether it's 30 minutes on the weekend, start something and build something for yourself. Even if the income does not come immediately, which, you know, fast forward, it, it's not going to come immediately. It's going to take some time and some energy and consistency, most importantly. But when you get started, that confidence you build in yourself, when you just have an idea and you take action on it uh, is is very empowering. Definitely. And then can you kind of give us a ballpark figure? So a comparison of how you were doing when you got that like first little affiliate commission to how the blog and how your whole business is doing now? Oh, certainly. Um, so you're going straight to it, aren't you? You're going straight for the numbers. My goodness. Well, I'll tell you first, I remember the first time that we got the indicator that, hey, maybe this is going to work was many years ago when we first got started. I think we were, my wife had written, you know, dozens of articles on her blog, but nothing had happened. And then eventually we got that first comment on a blog post. It was like, oh, somebody read my words, somebody cared enough about it, and they actually commented on the post. And I remember that night, again, there was zero dollars involved in that transaction, but we celebrated, we went out to our favorite uh, Mexican food uh, <laughs> place. I still remember the, the, the lighting and everything where we were when we got that first comment, because that was the initial indicator that, hey, we might be onto something here. Um, so in, in the lesson, the takeaway there, is please celebrate those small wins. Even if it isn't a big launch where you're making a million dollars in a day and all that kind of stuff that we see on social media everywhere, the reality of it is every little win counts and it, to keep those to heart. But all right, getting into your actual question about the income and like the growth and what happened. So probably our, in the first three months, we started to make some affiliate commissions. And uh, we did not start in the you know, the business of business. Like we started talking about our hobbies, about parenthood, some of those little really small uh, things that were interesting to us where we were at. And when we'd find a product that was interesting to us from Amazon or what, what have you, we'd put it into a blog post, make a couple pennies. Okay. So probably in the first six months of just starting that beginning uh, website, we probably made a total of five to $20 somewhere in there. We, we were probably not even covering our, our initial expenses. Uh, but that grew and grew with our skills and our confidence. And eventually we realized from our background, our engineering, um, the, whole, the idea of blogging about our personal lives and what we, what we were doing that day was not really what we wanted to be. We, we love the idea of business. We love processes. We love uh, you know, these systems of building businesses. And so we went down a slightly different road and we started to launch some digital products, which then started to bring in a few hundred dollars per month, turned into a, finally we made our first four figure month of a thousand dollars per month. And that probably took um, six months from starting that next thing. And when I left my job, I think we were making around the six figure mark with, uh, with that side hustle. And at the time I had a normal corporate salary. It was nothing to nothing too great, but it was providing for the bills. When I saw where we were getting to, it was like, okay, let me leave my job and let me go and try to replace my salary as quickly as possible. And so when I left in 2018, I started in January on my own. I didn't know I didn't have my own brand built up. I had been working with my wife. And so I immediately started with content marketing on YouTube and offering my services as a freelancer and as an agency owner. And I would do, I basically, I made the mistake of just selling yes. If people wanted an e-commerce store, I can build e-commerce stores. If people wanted a sales funnel, I could do sales funnel. Uh, don't do that because it's a very stressful <laughs> way to begin. But by the end of the first month, I had gotten up to $10,000 of income by you know leveraging a little bit of the brand that my wife and I had been building on the side for a few years, as well as simply showing up for my very small audience on YouTube and offering to help them and showing honesty and showing authenticity in my content. And it doesn't take 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. It doesn't take uh, you know, uh, tons of leads coming in if you have services to offer. So I'm very passionate about when you're getting started, if you want to go off on your own, offer your expertise. And if you don't have expertise, think again, because I guarantee you do. Somewhere, somehow, even if you can be a virtual assistant uh, offering to answer emails for a small business owner, or if you can learn a skill and then apply that skill, uh, you can go from zero to a full-time income with a lot of sweat equity, a lot of work, 
but uh, not that many clients. So from there to where we are now, like fast forward, there's a whole long story, which I'm not going to get into. Um, at this point now, we can comfortably uh, bring in over six figures per month uh, with our small business uh, of a very you know, small team of, I think we have about five people that work with us um, on the side and it gives us the ability. I'm looking over my backyard and I'm seeing the dog playing in the backyard right now while I'm having this conversation with you. And I just, it, it's been such an amazing journey to get from there to here. Well, definitely. Um, I think that celebrating those small wins is incredibly important. I know I can relate to that personally. We hit like 2000 subscribers last week and I was like, yes, we've been working really hard at this for the last six months <laughs> to get it. Congratulations. To 2000. So that was amazing. And yeah, definitely. I think people get kind of lost in the noise out there of, oh, I made a million this month or I made $10,000 in two weeks using this particular thing. And people get really disheartened and forget that that's probably not the whole story, first of all. And exactly. second of all, those small wins are super important. And yeah, you've got this absolutely now. And I think you also timed it really well because two years later, after you've quit your job and you've set yourself up to work remotely and be able to do what you're doing now, we've had this pandemic that's kind of shifted everyone into a similar position. So you've got a bit of a head start on us all. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, you're right. Uh, actually, the pandemic has been a terrible thing across the world, obviously. And, and I, you know, feel, you know, my heart goes out for anybody who's been suffering through it. Uh, but it has opened up anytime there's something crazy, a, a crisis or a problem that happens in any economy, any niche, any industry, it does create opportunities for somebody to thrive. And uh, what I like to think about is you can't, you can't control what happens in the world, but you can control how you respond to it. And so I've always tried to, especially with my kids, always try to show them, hey, even though something bad might have happened to you today, what can what good can you create from this situation? And you know, speaking about that pandemic, uh, which hopefully we're moving past, hopefully it's on its way out. Who knows? Um, exactly, fingers <laughs> crossed. It has created a lot of opportunity for those who either they want to work from home, they're looking for something that they can control because entrepreneurship, we hear a lot of being such an inconsistent income stream. You might have these months of making a thousand dollars and months of making zero dollars. And it honestly couldn't be further from the truth. And I believe that through this pandemic, a lot of people are coming to realize uh, what I believe is the truth of the matter is that as an entrepreneur, you're not beholden. You're not dependent on a single paycheck. You're not dependent on a single employer and a single industry. Uh, right now, um, just to kind of give an idea, between uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you can create as many different income streams as you'd like. And so, for our business, we've done, we've tried to diversify ourselves. You know, we like to be very risk averse. We have income from affiliate marketing, from recommending products we know, like, and trust. System.io yeah. is a fantastic software as well. Um, we sell online courses. We have several of those. We also have other products and services. And so, as a result of this, it's not meant to brag, but it's simply to show you the reality that. In times like this, where you're looking for where is the certainty amongst all the, the fog and the scariness out there, is if any one of our ventures, if any one of our income streams were to go away, we're not going to cry about it. We're not, we're not going to sweat it off because we have built a bit of a, a basis where we don't need to try to sell so hard. We don't need to try to you know, rel put all of our chips on the table on a single bet because we can create that uh, diversity. So if you're going through and you're thinking, hey, the, um, my my friend lost his job or I lost my job or, or a loved one going through that, uh, I can honestly tell you that obviously do what you need to do to make the, the rent this month, but please build up something that can become that second leg that you can stand on in uncertain times. I think it's excellent advice, especially at the moment when, like you said, so many people have suffered because of this. Now, I'd like to dig in a little bit to your specific skills. So sure. you are a, I called you a sales funnel specialist. Now, sales funnels, um, they may be slightly more familiar than they were. They've got an actual name now. People can kind of visualize them. But I think they can still be quite intimidating for newbies. So can you give us a non-technical definition of what a sales funnel is and why you need one? I will do my absolute best, but I can't promise anything because I am the more technical of uh, my wife and me. So the non-technical definition of sales funnels, I like to call it the journey. It's the journey that you take 
your prospect on, your lead, whatever term you want to use. Again, we'll, we'll not be technical here, but you have somebody you want to serve and you have some way in which you want to serve them. But it took me a good six months of knowing my wife when we were still just friends before I got her to date me. And it took me a couple of years when she started dating me before she would say yes to me asking her to marry me. And so the point is any relationship from a significant other to your business prospect, it doesn't happen like that. You don't just say, hello, buy my stuff. And then you make a lot of money. That's really not how it works for most businesses. And so the sales funnel using air quotes here is simply that process that you can create to automate and systematize that relationship that you build with your prospect. And so what it works out to is you realize what things, what conditions need to be true for this person to want to work with me, whether it's to buy my service, whether to buy my product, or to simply read my website. And how can I work backwards from the goal and create all these uh, parameters or create all these steps that they can go through? And how can I automate that so I don't need to do it every single time for every single person? And that's pretty much what a sales funnel is. I think that's a brilliant definition and a great one to make it more understandable. I love the idea that you've used your relationship as a kind of metaphor for it. I think it's brilliant. Um, yeah. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> it's really good. Um, and then to build onto that. So one of the biggest benefits of that sales funnel is, like you said, you, you can work from your end goal backwards and you've got this control over the kind of situation and where you put your, where you put your leads and where you're leading them to. So what are some of the other big benefits that you see from sales funnels? Oh, that's a great question. So the first thing I want to remind everybody is you all have a sales funnel. If you're selling anything, you have a sales funnel, but it may not be well devised. So point being, um, I just got a, my pool table. We moved houses recently. And so the I found a contractor and he came and he installed my pool table at the new house. And he has a sales funnel. If I were to ask him, hey, tell me about your funnel, he would tell me, what? And, and he would not think he has one. But the point of that is, if you make a sale, somehow you got from not knowing the person to having a sale there. So if you're reading, if you're watching this podcast or listening to it somewhere else in your commute, uh, just realize that if you're in business, you have a customer journey. Uh, I think where sales funnels really get useful is when you can start to map them out, plan them out, and automate them so you can see how it's working. Uh, you know, if you want to open up the phone book and cold call a thousand businesses today, some of them are going to say yes to talk to you on the phone. And then from there, some of them might sign up for some freebie and some of them might become a customer. That is a sales funnel. It's a really painful one because it requires a lot of work and it's one-on-one -on -one every single time. So what I like to do and, and the way that I see the benefits of the way we create sales funnels now online is that you can take those steps like okay before they can be your customer they have to really have some trust in you that you're going to take care of them okay so how do you build that trust and you can then say okay well i can show them some of the things i've done with previous customers okay maybe i need to create a case study all right so i've got a case study now let me take a step backwards how do they even get interested enough to learn about my past interactions if they've never heard of me before okay i need to give them something for free to get their you know to basically win them over and give them some ethical bribe of saying, hey, if you are eventually going to want to work with me, you're probably working on these steps right now. Let me create a valuable freebie or an opt-in video a training, something like that, that I can give to the world and allow them to kind of see a little bit about me so that I can then drag them along this process using things like emails and all of that. So uh, to zoom out a little bit, the benefits of sales funnels is you can map out this process in keeping it simple, please don't go so crazy with it. But once you have a process mapped out, you can see how many people are flowing through the process. If you use you know, tools like systems or there's a bunch of uh, you know, digital marketing softwares out there, uh, you can see how many visitors go from point A to point B and how many fall off. And you can say, hey, I'm losing 75% of my people right here. So how can I improve that step? And so instead of going from this one-off uh, 
you know, client to client type of hamster wheel, which we oftentimes start with, you can then start to think like an engineer, which is why I think I'm, I gravitate towards this so much is I can see the entire process laid out and I can see the problems. I can see the gaps and the opportunities. And then it becomes simply a, a scientific method of saying, Hey, this part is broken. I'm going to make a wild guess. I'm going to test it and it might get better, but it's not going to get any worse because I can always go back to what I have. So I think that repeatable nature of being able to see your entire process, how your sales come in to a like certainty, to a level where there's no doubt. And then it's just a matter of time and creativity to get you to being profitable and successful. I think that's an excellent way of putting it, kind of turning your sales funnel into a machine that you can maintain, that you can tweak, change fix the calibrations of it and ultimately improve it. Um, and then our last like big question on the sales funnel is how much of your funnel is dependent on your niche and your audience? So is it worth like, looking at your competitors and copying exactly what they have? Or should you hire an expert, especially for new business owners? Like we, I said, it can be quite intimidating to kind of walk into this and be like, uh, what should I do? So should they keep it simple, look for expert advice? What do you suggest? Oh, yeah, it's a great question. There's a ton of different ways we could take that answer. But I'll, I'll start with one thing that we teach people when they're just getting started is I want you to go through an exercise I like to call the three Ps. And you just draw three interlocking circles, like one of those little Venn diagrams. And each circle has a different name. So the first P is passion. So when you're going into launching your business, your funnel, and I just want you to realize that there's going to be some uphill battles that you need to fight uh, face in the future. Okay. So if you're not passionate about the thing, if you're just trying to see, Hey, what's my competition doing? Oh, they're making money doing that thing. I'm not passionate about that thing, but I see they're making money. So I'm going to copy them. That's not a formula for success. I want to make sure that at the, at the foundation, this is something you're interested in and you can see yourself for the next year to two to three years um, working on as a hobby. If it's something you can do as a hobby, then, okay, you're, you're good. Move on to the next step. The next, I want you to look at proficiency. The second P is proficiency. Is this something, I'm not talking about the sales funnel itself, but the, the niche, the industry, the audience, is this somebody that you have the ability to serve? And you may not consider yourself an expert. And by all means, like nobody, what is an expert really? It's somebody who's done something a lot and they've gotten better at it as they continue to do it. So you are an expert at anything relative to somebody else. What I mean by that is even if you are an intermediate at best at whatever it is, maybe it's um, you know building with Legos, it, it, you might not be an expert, but you might know how to build like a little Lego castle, which is super great. Guess what? There's a ton of people out there who don't know how to build Lego castles. So you are an expert to them. So whatever your industry is, if you're passionate about it, and it's something that you are decent at and you want to get better at, that is that checks the box there. All right, now getting to the root of your question about competition, the third P is profitability. So what I mean by that is, do people seemingly already make money doing this thing? I want that answer to be yes. So the idea of, oh my gosh, I see competition out there in the marketplace. I probably don't want to go there. Let me go a different direction. That's absolutely the opposite uh, effect you should have on that idea. Uh, if there's a market, that means there's market potential. That means you have the ability to profit from that industry. So when you have this perfect storm of something that you're relatively passionate about, something you're relatively proficient at, and something that shows indications of being able to make money from, and we'll talk about how you can identify that in a second. Now you have what you need to grow into that sales funnel and really double down. Um, and if you don't know if you could be profitable, do a Google search, look on Facebook, see if people are running advertisements. If you Google it and you see something related to your industry as an ad on Google, that's a really good sign. If you go to Facebook and you can go to their Facebook ads library and you can just search, search Facebook ads library and Google and search for your thing. If you see people are running ads to them, unless they like losing money, they're probably making some profit off of running ads. So it shows you there's the ability for you to stand out. All right. So um, I think I might be losing the trail here, but you're asking <laughs> where, how do people know where to get started with funnels? Was that, what was that uh, the question? It was, it was more about how much of your funnel is dependent on that niche. And mm, so mm. you told me how to kind of like identify that niche. And that's great because, yeah, there's no point in getting started with your funnel until you're sure that it's worth putting the effort in there. So then now that you've got it, if you've figured out if it is something you're passionate about, if it is something you're proficient at and then it's a profitable niche, 
what do you do thereafter? Absolutely. So I am a big believer in modeling success. Um, you know, you might he hear it called funnel hacking or things like that. Um, so a couple of disclaimers there. What that means, first of all, like definition is, if you see somebody who is seemingly successful throughout this research we talked about, um, don't try to do the exact opposite of what they're doing because they might have already tried that and found out it didn't work. Now, modeling success does not mean copying. Modeling success does not mean plagiarizing. Um, I, I certainly want to make sure that if you try to start from zero and copy somebody else who's already at level 10, level 12, level 20, whatever the case might be, guess what? You're not going to win because if you're going to, if you're trying to be a carbon copy of somebody who's already a, a, ahead of you and above you, why should anybody work with you or buy, buy from you? So I want you to be able to model success, meaning see somebody who's achieve the, the goals you want and kind of dissect and, and understand how do they get there? What is their angle? What are they offering? How are they helping people? And take lessons and learnings from that. Hey, if they're offering a, a, check, a checklist that helps people be successful in your industry, maybe a checklist would be helpful for you. That doesn't mean copy their checklist, but it's showing things that have uh, you know all signs of success that you can use for your own audience. But guess what? You are uniquely you. You have your own um, brand. You have your own voice. You have your own style. Like I'm kind of all over the place. Some people are funny. I'm certainly not. Um, so you can see people who are successful, but then you can inject your own you-ness into that and create a unique offer, create a unique brand and a style. So to answer your question, if you're getting started with your funnels and you're not sure what to use, I certainly recommend go and scour, do uh, go on a fact finding mission and see what is currently working and then see what you would do to improve it. See, as you're reading through somebody else's offer, their sales page, their, you know, opt-in, whatever, what, what, what problems would you have? If you have some proficiency in that industry, there's likely some opportunity you can discover, uncover and highlight through your own offer, which could make you stand out and catapult into success. Definitely. I think that's a, a really nicely, like fully fleshed out answer that'll take them from, like you said, from figuring out your niche and then like, taking those first steps to building your first funnel. Um, and I like the idea that you haven't like expressly said, go hire a professional, you don't know what you're doing. Because I think it's important that people, especially when you're starting out, you sort of have an idea of what you're doing. Because if it breaks, you don't want to have to worry about hiring a funnel expert to fix what they put together for you again. Yeah. Good. And let, let me, let me chime in there on that one, Natasha. So I am a funnel expert and I'll tell you, be wary of funnel experts. Like <laughs> this is a wonderful sales pitch, right? Work with me. No, like I honestly believe that every small business owner, when you get to a certain level that this kind of breaks down, but I do believe if you're going to hire somebody to help you, I want you to at least be competent enough to know when you're working with a good person or a good service provider. Um, I have been in situations where uh, I, I would be talking to friends and who have similar, you know, they're in a similar place and they're hiring people to do things I know how to do, but I don't like to work with my friends so much. It just creates the weird relationship. So anyways, I'm, I'm just talking to them and I realize they're working with somebody that they really should not be working with. And so if you're getting started with your funnel, um, try to learn as much as you can and realize when you are good enough to hire it out. And what I mean by that is when you have the skills where, okay, you, you might not be an expert at design. You might not even really know how all the tech works, but you know what you're looking for and you know what the service provider should be doing. At that point, I think it's a great idea to hire somebody if they can add value to your business. But I never like seeing the small business owners get in this position where they're spending thousands of dollars per month of money they don't have on somebody who maybe is not doing the best job. So please be careful. Uh, you know, the internet's a big place. There's people who are trustworthy, who are authentic, and you tend to find them around a lot. But if it's somebody you've never heard of and you're calling it, just please be sure to protect yourself. And you can always reach out to me if you need any help and just to run some ideas off of uh, whoever you're working with. Yeah, I think that's a really important one to kind of have a certain level of proficiency in your own sales funnel so that you can see if what's being done for you is actually adding value. And now one okay. of our big questions from our audience is about traffic sources and the best traffic mm -hmm. sources. So lots of people are unsure whether they should go paid or unpaid. So a lot of people kind of leave a lot of hate on paid ads and say it's a get rich quick scheme. And now with Facebook ads being quite as expensive as they are and Google ads doing interesting things with algorithms, 
What is your hot take on this pay traffic source? Oh, that's a wonderful question. And I don't know if there's a single right answer. I'll give you um, my right answer. All right. Um, we started with blogging. We still blog. But right now, just to give you an idea of kind of where we're coming from. So where do we get our traffic for our business? And we'll kind of talk about a little bit of the pros and cons of the different traffic sources and maybe help your audience make an educated um, place of where they want to go. So right now, we get traffic from several different sources. So we have organic SEO, which basically means we write content or we make videos and people search for them and they find them and they find us. So uh, that can be through blog traffic. It could also be through YouTube videos where um, we don't go after the, the biggest, we don't have these massive uh, channels, but the traffic we get to our content is very good traffic because they're coming directly for what we can help them with, which means they click into our funnels, they sign up, and they oftentimes become customers because we give a lot of value out for free. Okay, so organic is great. I'm gonna go to paid and I love paid traffic, but I do wanna preface that by saying organic traffic you it's it's hard to match because it takes a ton of time and energy and effort to build it up but it can be assets that live in your business for a long time which is a huge benefit there and also everybody has finite resources the resources are both time and money um you know organic is great because it takes zero money you know air quotes again <laughs> zero money but it takes a lot of time and so you can gravitate towards whichever method makes sense for wherever your scarcest resource is. Uh, when you have, when you're starting out bootstrapping, organic makes a lot of sense because you can put in the hours. You can't really put in the thousands of dollars you don't have. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, on the paid side, we do a few different paid traffic sources. Um, primarily, is Facebook ads. But we also have an affiliate program for our own products and services, where if our audience or our past customers or clients are um, they like what we do and they want to refer out to other people affiliate marketing is fantastic because we only pay if the traffic converts so people can sign up to be an affiliate we get a link i know uh, a lot of software like system has a really cool um, affiliate management system which is awesome and people can find out about us hear from word of mouth and they convert very well because their friend who they know like and trust recommends us and then once they sign up we can give a percentage of whatever they buy back to the referral so affiliate marketing is fantastic but of all of them uh facebook ads is my personal favorite and i think it often it just comes back to mindset um I have a bit of a system thinking mindset. And I think a lot of people who fail with Facebook ads, they don't fail because they're not good at ads. They fail because they have bad data. They have bad information and therefore they can't make good decisions. And as we go back to our sales funnel analogy, once you have your entire sales process mapped out on a canvas or in a software, something like that in front of you, at that point, it doesn't become a matter of, um, you know, what is this magic bullet that's going to make it work? It becomes incrementally getting better at what you do until it becomes profitable. And let me illustrate that. So let's make a very simple example where you have a Facebook ad that drives traffic to a sales page, which becomes customers, right? Obviously, most funnels will have a few more steps included, but for simplicity, like if you know that, hey, I can put $100 into advertising and I get, let's say, 150 clicks over my page. And if I know that my page converts at 10%, I'm not gonna be able to do this math. I'm not really a mental math yeah. kind of person, <laughs> but you'll be able to see, okay, I put hundred dollars in and I got maybe $60 out in sales. Okay, close but no cigar. What do you do at that point? Do you say, oh, I'm burning money on Facebook ads and I'm gonna turn it off and try something new? No, that, that is absolutely gonna spin your wheels until you get nowhere fast. What you can do instead is, okay, something is broken. Do I need to get clicks on my ads for cheaper? Or like, what levers can I pull? What handles can I pull to create better results? So that's when you start doing things like testing out different ads, testing out different audiences, testing out different uh, videos on your sales page, different price points. At that point, it becomes, here's all the variables that go from me putting money into this engine called Facebook advertising and getting money out in terms of sales or clients or whatever your income stream is. And so why I love Facebook ads is, if you do it the right way, meaning you don't just put a thousand dollars in, you close your eyes and you walk away. <laughs> if you do it where you're thoughtful and you're systematic and you're data driven and not emotion driven, like these are all very key uh, elements of it. Once you can kind of unlock that part of your brain and have a tool like system.io or any others where you can actually see how it's performing and where your opportunities are, at that point, it's simply a matter of putting, let's say, a hundred dollars into ads. See, and then stopping them and then seeing what happened 
and then putting on your white chemist coat and saying, okay, we need to run an experiment to get this better. And then you tweak a variable, you change the sales page and you put another hundred dollars in. And eventually what you're going to find is you're going to inch up to that point where a hundred dollars goes in and a hundred dollars comes out. So you're not making money. You're not losing money, but then you realize what's actually happening is I'm getting maybe uh, in that hundred dollars, I'm getting 50 people on my email list and I'm not losing any money. And then the next month you can email those people for free. And then uh, so it starts to become this amazing engine where with the right mindset, Facebook ads, I think are the surest path to success. Whereas you can spend a year on SEO and all of a sudden it takes one Google algorithm change. And that year's worth of work has now been cut in half. So I personally love it. Uh, but we can go wherever you want to uh, based on that little intro of my <laughs> traffic passions. No, I think that's a, that's a great kind of like personal experience. And then also some advice for if you are going to go the paid route, you can't just, like you said, put the money in, close your eyes and hope for the best. You've got to actually take a look at what's happened, test, change, tweak, and treat it like something that is still a process. I think people assume that SEO, that takes long. It's a process. We know that. But then with Facebook ads or paid Google ads, they think, oh, no, it's plug and play. It'll be magic. So, yeah, some... <laughs> Anybody who says that is trying to sell you a course and they're not looking out for your best interests. Um, I'll be honest. I, I also teach Facebook ads. I do it with clients. I also do it with some of our uh, course students. But guess what? I'm not, there's no promise for instant results. There's no promise of an easy button. The truth is this is all a matter of risk management, meaning like don't get, put the thousand dollars in and walk away. It's, it's, it's being on top of it. It's finding the system. It's also being flexible. And um, so, yeah, like, please y'all Facebook ads is like anything else. It's effort. It's work. It also takes some money, but it's one of those things where once you get into that profit zone, where you're making a little bit of money on your ads on the front end, you can, let's say you put a hundred dollars in, you get 110 out, you made $10 a profit. You can put that in and now you're putting more money in on a daily yeah. basis. And you can create this really interesting uh, uh, flywheel effect of growing your cash flow and getting it back very quickly. So, uh, but no, it's not, not an easy button by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, definitely not. And then to kind of hop onto the slower co content marketing strategy, it is more of a slow burn, like you've said, um, but is there any advice that you can offer to help people maximize their results from the start? Because I think you even mentioned that when you started with um, blogging, it was about stuff that you were interested in and stuff that was like maybe topical and interesting for your life, but not necessarily an area where you could see profits. So what do you advise? Absolutely. Um, the first thing is understand why you're creating content. Are you creating content to get something off your chest or are you getting content to position yourself as an expert in an area to offer something to somebody? And in most cases, if you want to make money, you want to be on that second half or you want to position yourself as an expert to uh, create an offer and offer it to people. Okay. So if we accept that to be true, <laughs> what next? All right. So it all comes down to what your business is all about. What is your offer? How do you want to help the world? Okay. Now, if we think about funnels, that is the end result, what you want to get out of the whole experience. Now, what needs to be true for people to trust you to want to do that? So then you want to work backwards from, okay, let's say, for example, sales funnels, since we're talking about it all day. Um, if I want to make my, <laughs> if I want to make my income by offering high ticket sales funnel services for clients, what do I need to be? on YouTube or on Google or something like that so that people are interested in me. Well, first, I need to show that I know what I'm talking about because oftentimes people will show these you know, unbelievable testimonials, but they'll never actually tell you that they know what they're talking about. And they just try to dupe people in by having all these wonderful reviews. But if you can help people by actually helping them through your free content on YouTube, and maybe it's not the most viral thing. You might only get a few hundred views from your videos, which is a fantastic success as well. But if the content you create is an asset, it's something that is not just like the news where a week later, it's kind of worthless, it's, it's, it's past. Mm -hmm. If you can create content that is evergreen, it's, it could be conceptual, it can be showing a quick tip, it can be you know reviewing a software, things that show that you know what you're talking about in your specific industry, that content can live on for days, weeks, months, and years and still be helpful. And so while I love organic traffic, is in the beginning, if you're trying to replace your full-time income or something like that, your job, go after offering services where in your content, you can show what 
a business owner that might be a good fit for your service, what are they thinking about? What are they searching for? What problems are they trying to do on their own before they get to that hiring decision? Answer that question for free on YouTube. And then as you're answering it, if the, hey guys, you have something at the end of your video. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see if we'd be a good fit to work together, or if you'd like to learn how I use my process to help small businesses like yourself achieve this goal, go ahead and click the link down below and check out my whatever, you, you know, set a free appointment or watch this case study, something like that. Boom, you've entered them into your own sales funnel now, and you can get to where you have a full-time income with just a few clients. And so those don't worry about chasing thousands of views or likes or subscribes, worry about getting results, which is actual money in your pocket and clients on your list. So um, that would be where I would think about organic traffic. Don't chase the vanity metrics, go after easier to tackle words, like you know, go after a longer tail, they call it, you know, harder, um, you know, instead of going after make money online, maybe it's how to make your first $400 selling digital marketing services with WordPress or something like that. Like something that's gonna be easier for you to show up for and you can build up your authority, build up your brand and build up your income that way. Yeah, and those hyper-specific long tail keywords, they're much easier to target. Um, it's often a specific question that someone's actually looking for while they start with the like, how do I make money online search? They're gonna then be like, okay, but that's too vague. I need something more specific, more specific, more specific, and then they'll find you. Um, yeah, yeah. And then let's dig into social media for a bit. So okay. you have quite the following on YouTube. Um, how did you grow that following? Was it part of this content marketing strategy or what did you do? And why did you choose YouTube? Oh, great questions. Well, first of all, I'm flattered that you think I have a large following. I certainly don't <laughs> think so, up. but I think at, at any stage, you always think somebody who has more subscribers is better than you. And so that's like that imposter syndrome that you're never going to get over. Anybody who's listening to this, if you have one subscriber on YouTube or 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, there's always going to be somebody who's bigger and better than you. And that's just the game. And uh, listen to happy music and uh, <laughs> you'll be okay. Uh, always just compare yourself to where you were a year ago and you'll be fine. Um, but why did I choose YouTube? Well, first of all, I started with blogging. And I'll be honest with you, I don't like blogging. It's just not something that I enjoy doing. Um, it's a fantastic thing to do. It's just not my personality. My wife is giving me the stink eye over there. She's right next to me and she's staring at me because she's all about the blogging. So the point of that is any traffic source can work. But for me, YouTube had a few benefits. For one, um, you can rank videos very quickly on YouTube. Uh, meaning if people go to Google or they go to YouTube and they search for something, if you have a, a website or a blog, it can take a little while for you to, um, to really have that website show up and surface your result. That's just how Google works. YouTube, on the other hand, I would have a video that would rank for the keyword I wanted within 24 hours of publishing the video. And I think that's also because I go after pretty easy to tackle words, but um, YouTube is fantastic for that reason. It's the second largest search engine behind Google in the world is YouTube. And also it's like a double, double whammy because you can search on Google and still get YouTube results. So I love YouTube, it's fantastic. Um, the second reason is it was easier for me to create that content. I don't feel the need to have this highly polished video content. Um, I, I can just turn the webcam on, have an idea, have a few bullet points of what I wanna talk about and just share what I know with the world. And that's a fantastic way of kind of giving back and feeling both authentic as well as strategic at the same time, uh, because that content is very engaging. They can see my face. They can understand if I'm full of it or if I know what I'm talking <laughs> about. And that can be hugely valuable there. Um, and so that's why I chose YouTube and it's been fantastic. There's other traffic sources we play with, but I, I kind of go back to YouTube as being my bread and butter because it's, um, it's not ephemeral. Like the content lives on after you post it. And I, I don't like spending my, uh, spinning my wheels on content, like on TikTok. I, I know a lot of people are doing that and that's fantastic. Keep it up, but I want my content to live on for more than, you know, more than a few weeks. Um, definitely. And I think the, the kind of move to video content has made it more interesting. And there are a lot more people who are using, like you said, those ephemeral forms of video content where it's short little clips and that works for some industries. But I think YouTube's a nice one because not only is it entertainment based, like a lot of those, but it also has this kind of educational base to it. People come to YouTube to learn how to do something. Even if it is something as ridiculous as like how to fix a dishwasher, they come and search, how do I fix this model dishwasher? And they want to see and interact with something that's gonna give them the things they need. And I think what YouTube does on top of blogging, and your wife might be angry with me from the background there, 
but um, you have this ability to kind of show and tell on YouTube that is a little bit more difficult on blogging, where you can kind of give them the information, share your experiences, but people like to see and know something and someone to trust them. So I think, like you said, showing your face on here kind of gives you that leg up. Absolutely. But I will also uh, you know, come back and say, I chose YouTube also because I watch YouTube. If I want to learn something, I don't go straight to Google to search it. I go to YouTube because for me, if I if it's I was on a ladder fixing an electrical outlet the other day, I'm not an electrician, but I had a YouTube video pulled up and I took all proper precautions <laughs> and I was able to go and, and do the job because that's how I want to learn. I don't want to go through a blog post and read 2000 words to get there. But um, other people listen to podcasts as their primary way of getting information. So create a podcast if you're looking for that. And others who want to search and skim and get the blog post and go become a blogger. So really be selfish and create the content that you would consume because you're probably going to create better content if it's in the same format that you like consuming. And then you also know that there's a guaranteed audience of people who are looking for it because you're one of them, right? Exactly. Okay. And then, um, my last like big question for you is what does the future look like for you is there a medium term or a long term goal that you're looking towards oh wow thinking ahead we don't do that very often <laughs> we're very much just uh chase the kids around yes absolutely for the medium to long term uh we're at a position now where we have created uh, several online products that sell pretty much on autopilot through our sales funnels and we're looking for that way of serving our audience at a higher level. And so in this year, just to kind of let you guys know is uh, we do love the idea of helping people with what they're doing. I've done one-on-one -on -one done for you services, which is great, but there's more that can be offered when you can scale that out to one versus many. And so there will be certainly a higher ticket, more you know, fun things that we can facilitate using all the great tools that are out there where like my goal is to help a thousand other families achieve what we have achieved. And so we're switching away from just like, okay, what can we do to, you know, create products that are honestly helpful, but also just pay the bills. And now I really want to be switching to be a bit more mission focused of, I want to see more of those success stories, more of those people who have quit their job or, or whatever their individual goal is. But, you know, we've created a brand called freedom by number. And the reason is that these processes, these blueprints, these courses we teach, they really are that blueprint to create whatever the freedom is for you, the, the taker, the, the, you know, the course uh, taker. And uh, so my wife and I, we love working together. Uh, we get fired up to, you know, go on our long walks with our puppy dog and think about, you know, what is our, what are our students struggling with? How can we help them? And now with where we are, we can really turn that around to seeing, okay, what is the greatest need and serve that? So I'm very excited for the future. Oh, it's an incredible thing to look forward to. All right. And now a couple of very short questions. So um, the first one, what advice would you give to your 18 year old self looking back? Hmm, my 18 year old self, um, keep, keep creating websites. I made my first website, I think when I was 16 years old. And if I knew then what I knew now, uh, we would be in a very different position. We're in a good position now, but when you have a skill and you show some, uh, some proficiency at it early, go after it. I might not have gone to college if I had um, <laughs> done what I did at, at 16 and I kept going. So uh, find your passion and pursue it as hard as you can. All right. And then, um, our last question is, um, where can our listeners find you? So if you let me know any of your tags, I will put them in the comments and description. Sure. My wife and I, we're on YouTube and Facebook and all those different places, right? We have a few websites, uh, but I'll send you, if you want to like take all the stuff I kind of threw at you guys on this podcast, I do have a checklist. It's my funnel launch uh, blueprint. It goes through every step. It shows the tools, the steps, the considerations, and the problems when you're launching that first sales funnel and trying to get it profitable. So if you want to get a free copy of that, just put your email address in and download it. You can go to unbeatabletech.com slash blueprint, and there should probably be a link in the show notes as well. And just get that, and it'll go into more depth than I was able to do on this podcast here. Okay, fantastic. John, thank you so much for joining me today and giving me your time. And thank you to our listeners today. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to us on a podcasting app, subscribe to the System podcast so that you never miss an episode. System.io is a digital marketing software platform packed with all the tools you need to grow your online business.